Voiceless, the procedural gap in algorithmic justice Neve Kinchin International Journal of Law and Information Technology, Volume 32, Issue 1, 2024, published, 06 November, 2024. Abstract conversations about algorithms and fairness can overlook the bifurcation of justice, whilst distributed justice is integral to accountability for algorithmic bias and related harms, without procedural justice and voice, defined as consent, transparency, and a right to be heard, algorithmic decisions will fail to find legitimacy in acceptance, fairness metrics respond better to distributive justice because algorithmic bias is primarily framed in such terms. The potential of AI ethics guidelines and formal regulation to address voice is compromised by ambiguous concepts of fairness, rigidity, and competing market demands. The scope of a right to a fair trial limits the potential of human rights impact assessments to address procedural rights, jurisdictional issues of reviewability, interpretation, and applicability challenge judicial review in examining the capacity of these accountability mechanisms to ensure voice. A procedural gap emerges in algorithmic decision-making. Introduction technology is rarely value-neutral. Algorithms absorb and reflect the conditions under which they are selected, designed, developed, and implemented. Hence the rise of algorithmic bias. Algorithmic bias occurs when algorithms maintain and amplify inequity based on protected and unprotected human characteristics. 1. That are prone to discrimination, such as race, sex, gender, sexual orientation, religion, disability, and age. Amidst society's increasing demands for the meaningful convergence of technology and ethical values, there is a growing expectation for algorithmic justice. Justice theories tend to define justice as comprising distributive and procedural elements. Underpinning this paper is the argument that algorithmic justice tends to better respond to distributive justice leaving a procedural gap that manifests most notably in the concept of voice. This procedural gap is evident across the spectrum of accountability mechanisms, including fairness metrics, regulatory frameworks, human rights, and judicial review. Following Part 1's exploration of the concept of voice in algorithmic justice, Part 2 examines fairness metrics, which are tools designed to combat algorithmic bias. Because algorithmic bias has primarily been defined in terms of distributed justice, such as non-discrimination, it is logical that algorithmic fairness tools have been designed to respond accordingly. Consequently, procedural justice and voice have been sidelined. In Part 3, Artificial Intelligence AI, ethics guidelines and statutory instruments are considered under the banner of regulation. Whilst guidelines and instruments prioritize transparency, their ability to ensure voice is curtailed by amorphous concepts of fairness, an inability to sufficiently respond to context, and competing commercial demands. Part 4 focuses on human rights as an accountability mechanism for algorithmic justice. Human rights impact assessments are a positive step forward in ensuring that developers of algorithmic decision-making protect human rights. However, Due process human rights have several limitations that will exclude many algorithmic decisions from its scope. Part 5 focuses on judicial review. Taking a comparative approach, Australian Common Law Judicial Review, the US Constitution's Due Process Clause, and the European application of subsidiarity reveal complex, largely jurisdiction, specific factors that support and impede the assurance of voice in algorithmic justice by the courts. Framing algorithmic justice Underpinning the expectation for algorithmic justice is the challenge of overlaying existing legal and normative notions of justice onto algorithms. As a normative concept, justice prioritizes perception. According to rules, a public conception of justice is where everyone, including basic social justice institutions, accepts and knows that others accept the same principles of justice. Point to the perception of justice rules alludes to is broadly understood to be represented by distributive and procedural justice. Three distributive justice centers on deprivation versus gratification for and is often associated with theories of utilitarianism, libertarianism, liberalism, and socialism. Five, according to distributive justice, a person will perceive the fairness of a decision outcome based on how fairly rewards and resources are distributed according to a particular decision, making context, 
6. A simple example of distributive justice is the Scandinavian practice of setting parking fines based on the ability of the person to pay. 7. Procedural justice reflects the perceived fairness of decision processes. When procedures are just, decisions will be accepted, even when a decision disadvantages an individual. 8. Perceptions of control of procedure and outcome are critical for the rejection of egocentric or outcome favorability bias, which is when people favor outcome distributions that benefit themselves more than others. 9. Ampere's disputant may be willing to relinquish control over the outcome of the decision, but not so the procedure. 10. Perceptions of procedural justice have been described as dominated by four issues. Neutrality, respect, trustworthiness, and voice. McDermott and others describe neutrality as being conveyed when authorities treat people in an even-handed manner. Whilst respect is a matter of being treated with politeness and dignity, trustworthiness involves authorities showing goodwill towards people and concern for their welfare. And voice refers to the opportunity to participate in decision, making processes and express one's point of view. 11. Procedural justice has also been described as consistency, accuracy, ethicality, representativeness, bias suppression, and correctability. 12. Law broadens and contextualizes normative concepts of justice by creating connections with the practice of rulemaking, judicial decision making, remedies, and constitutionalism. Distributive justice in the law, also known as material or substantive justice, is the perceived fairness 13 of decision outcomes, represented by the substantive aims of legal rules. 14. Procedural justice is the perception of fair treatment during a decision-making procedure, represented by, for example, due process clauses and principles of procedural fairness that are embedded in judicial review and procedural law. 15. Administrative justice extends procedural justice to public governance and administrative decision-making. Administrative justice has at its core the administrative decisions by public authorities that affect individual citizens and the mechanisms available for the provision of redress. 16. According to Mashaw, administrative justice comprises three sometimes intersecting models, bureaucratic rationality, professional treatment, and moral judgment. 17 which rely upon accountability within good administration and decision making, although difficult to define precisely. There is broad consensus that administrative justice draws on core principles, such as accountability, transparency, consistency, rationality, impartiality, participation, procedural fairness and reasonable access to judicial and non-judicial grievance mechanisms. 18 crucially, Administrative justice is responsive to the competing demands of public administration, such as policy implementation, consistency, efficiency, and budgetary constraints. 19. Although Fuller does not use the language of administrative justice, he speaks to this need for balance when he characterizes procedural values as the ways in which a system of rules governing human conduct must be constructed and administered if it is to be efficacious, and at the same time remain what it purports to be. 20. Similarly, Sossin states that although all dispute resolution bodies and mechanisms seek to provide solutions to people's problems, the entities and mechanisms which are part of administrative justice also seek to advance a particular policy goal. 21. Accordingly, administrative justice is the justice inherent in routine day two, day administration 22 as well as individual rights to good administration and fair procedure. The challenge of algorithmic justice is framing it in a way that balances distributive and procedural justice. Whilst distributive justice is crucial, if it is elevated at the expense of procedural justice, algorithmic decision-making is less likely to find acceptance. Further, the ability to respond to the competing pressures of public administration will be challenging. The remainder of this paper will explore how accountability mechanisms for algorithmic justice, fairness metrics, regulatory frameworks, human rights, and judicial review, struggle to ensure the representation of voice in algorithmic justice, leaving a procedural gap. Finding voice in algorithmic justice fundamentally, the concept of voice in procedural justice means that a person has an opportunity to be heard. Lind and others present two theories of procedural justice that explain the centrality of voice. First, instrumental theories presume that people believe that an opportunity to express their views will help them control decisions, and that their arguments might persuade the decision-maker to provide a better outcome. 23 Second, non.
Instrumental theories claim that people value voice because it suggests that their views are worthy of hearing, even when there is no chance of influencing the decision. 24 Either approach suggests that voice legitimizes decision, making through acceptance. However, the voice in algorithmic justice is not well defined, and has not received much attention despite the broad empirical base of procedural justice in organizational justice research. 25 Focusing on procedural justice in algorithms. Morse and Teodoresco acknowledge that voice is closely related to Leventhal's procedural justice criteria of representativeness, which demands that procedures duly consider the needs and concerns of the entire group. However, the authors do not focus on procedural justice as it falls outside Leventhal's theory. 26. A study on algorithmic fairness by Bins and others did not include voice when they asked the subjects of their study whether they had been able to express their views and feelings, because it was difficult to interpret due to the hypothetical nature of the scenarios, being too human-specific, to apply to a computer-based interaction. Point two seven. Speaking in the context of algorithms in employee relations, Robert and others describe voice as the opportunity to communicate with and give feedback to the AI. Employees should be able to express their opinions about how an AI system has treated them, and indicate when they do not understand it. The authors provide an example of a flagging feature that could enable employees to indicate inaccurate data about their work performance or outcomes. 28. Lee and others point out that the ability to express concerns or opinions at each stage of decision-making is critical. 29. In a study that measured the importance of voice in a monitoring task on temperature scales, Helwig and others found an opportunity to express one's views before a decision resulted in a higher perception of the overall fairness of the computer system, indicating that voice is a construct that should receive more attention in the context of fair automatic decision making. Point three zero transparency is an integral element of voice. If voice is the ability to express one's views at different stages of the algorithmic decision making process, the algorithm must be explainable and its criteria evident. Transparency, or informational justice, is determined by the quality with which explanations are provided regarding how decisions are made, and why certain outcomes were reached. 31 Lee and others suggest a procedural justice framework that relies on transparency and controllers, fairness measures. In their study, an interface communicated algorithmic rules to the user through a step-by-step -step diagram, displaying algorithmic outcomes via inputs and outputs. Voice was ensured when participants in the study could use the interface to explore, discuss, and ultimately choose alternative outcomes. 32. Without being able to identify the factors that drive the autonomous self-learning of AI systems, it is impossible to communicate the reasons for its outcomes, or to ensure the algorithm's reasoning process accounts for all relevant factors. Some have argued that the need for transparency translates into a right to an explanation, pointing to the EU General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, as its regulatory vessel. 33. Regardless of whether transparency can be folded into rights, it is considered central to due process associated with algorithmic decision-making. 34. Keats Citron claims that technological due process requires an explanation for a judgment and an audit trail. An audit trail is a detailed map that reveals rules, the identity of the people who record and assess facts, and the history of decisions. 35. Finally, consent is a fundamental component of voice in algorithmic justice. Individuals must be able to provide prior, free, and informed consent. 36. Before an algorithm makes a decision that affects them, individuals must have genuine autonomy, which involves being adequately informed of the fact that an algorithm is involved in the process, and the level of involvement of humans. Some have argued that due process requires a judgment by a human decision maker. 37. Especially where there is discretion. 38. Whilst a human in the loop may often be desirable, it cannot be a blanket rule, especially for low-level or low-risk algorithms. The potential for limited or no input by humans in the decision-making process creates a critical need for the impacted individual to appreciate the level of human involvement to ensure consent is genuinely informed. The multiplicity of algorithms and decision-making contexts means that voice in algorithmic justice must have a broad application to be effective.
The meaning of voice in algorithmic justice that has been developed to inform the following analysis is an opportunity for an individual to provide a informed consent to the use of an algorithm and b feedback after the criteria for an algorithmic decision are explained and before the decision has been made. Fairness metrics, an emphasis on substantive issues of non-discrimination and equity and algorithmic bias, has meant that research into the theory and design of algorithmic fairness in organizational theory, psychology, and computational studies has tended to focus on distributive over procedural justice. 39 as a consequence, procedural justice and, thus, voice remain largely unaddressed in fairness metrics. Instead, the metrical implementation of procedural justice is defined by subjectivity and an inability to respond to administrative justice. Algorithmic bias can occur at different points of the life cycle of an AI system. Bias can arise in the data that feeds the algorithm, in the model itself, and through embedded social inequality. Algorithms are trained on data to recognize patterns and correlations. Data-based or statistical bias occurs when the data does not represent the entire population to which the algorithm will be applied. Data-based bias, which is passed from the data to the algorithm, 40 can arise in several ways. Measurement bias occurs when data features and labels are used as imperfect proxies for the real values of interest. Point four one. For example, arrest rates are often used as proxies for crime rates. But because minority communities are more highly policed, arrest rate proxies are differentially mismeasured from the crime rate, i.e. the real value of interest. Point four two representation bias arises when the chosen input data only represents a portion of the population. For example, datasets collected through smartphone apps can underrepresent lower income or elder groups who are less likely to own smartphones. Point four three aggregation bias relates to inappropriately combined populations during model construction. 44 which causes false conclusions to be drawn about individuals from observing the entire population. 45. This one-size-fits-all model ignores the fact that group membership can be indicative of different backgrounds, cultures, or norms, and a variable can mean different things for people in different groups. 46 An example is a project that analyzed Twitter posts of Chicago-based gang users, which misinterpreted lyrics from a local rapper as threats of violence. 47 Limited, variable bias occurs when one or more important variables are left out of the model. An example would be an algorithm that predicts subscribers to a system, but fails to predict an increase in cancellations, because it does not factor in a new, strong competitor in the market. 48 Finally, linking bias arises when the attributes of networks obtained from user connections, activities, or interactions differ and misrepresent the user's actual behavior. 49 Modeling or method bias arises when the model reproduces unfair patterns encoded in the data, reinforces existing patterns of social advantage or creates new ones. 50 Merabi describes modeling bias as algorithm to user bias, indicating that the algorithm is biased, not the algorithm. 51 Types of modeling bias include user interaction bias, which is when the user self-selects biased behavior and interactions. 52 in the model learns from and reinforces that behavior. For example, a study found that YouTube's restricted mode was censoring Lukashkia plus content because the algorithm was based on people flagging such videos. 53 popularity bias largely occurs in recommender systems, such as e-commerce or streaming sites, egg, Amazon and Netflix, when already popular items receive more exposure through recommendations, which can lead to a feedback loop. 54 Emergent bias arises from the use and interaction with real users 55 rather than the data the algorithm has been trained upon. The algorithm may not have been designed to address changes in populations, cultural values, or societal knowledge, so it creates bias bubbles that curate information based on user interaction, such as liking social media posts. 56 Evaluation bias occurs when an algorithm's training or benchmark data doesn't represent a minority group. 57 Facial recognition tools can return evaluation bias because the algorithm is trained on largely lighter skin data sets, with only minimal data representing dark skin subjects. 58 Finally, deployment bias arises when there is a mismatch between the problem a model is intended to solve and how it is used. An 
Example this algorithmic risk assessment tools in the criminal justice context that are meant to predict the likelihood of a person committing a future crime, but are used in ways not initially intended, such as to help determine the length of the sentence. 59. Societal bias reflects long-standing structural inequalities in society. 60. Which, if encoded in a policy, contradict the decision-maker's goals, regardless of the representativeness and accuracy of the training data. 61. Sources of societal bias include historical bias, which arises when existing bias infiltrates the data generation process. 62. For example, women's family and caring responsibilities can be a barrier to leadership roles in the workplace and produce reduced employment opportunities. Such structural issues led to a gender pay gap. If an AI system is trained to determine an individual's suitability as a customer based on income level, it would likely exhibit preferential treatment towards men. 63. Population bias emerges when different statistics, demographics, representatives, and user characteristics appear in the user population of the platform compared to the original target population. 64. For instance, Twitter users have been found to be significantly overrepresented by men and urban populations. At the same time, women tend to be overrepresented on Pinterest. 65. Revealing that demographic attributes such as age, gender, race, socioeconomic status, and internet literacy are drivers of the likelihood of someone using a social platform. 66. Self-selection bias occurs when research subjects who are most invested in a topic are more likely to participate in the research. For example, participants who are the most enthusiastic supporters of a political candidate are also more likely to participate in a study about enthusiasm for that candidate. 67. Social bias happens when our judgment is implicitly affected by the actions of others, such as changing a score due to the influence of other people's higher ratings. 68. As algorithmic bias is constructed in terms of distributive justice, so too is algorithmic fairness. 69. For example, Home considers algorithmic fairness in relation to Broom's theory of fairness in which fairness applies to the distribution of goods between people and requires that claims should be satisfied in proportion to their strength. Seventy other scholars have considered people's perception of fairness in relation to tax auditing. 71 loan decisions. 72 an algorithmic hiring and evaluation. 73 all of which are distributive justice issues. The emphasis on distributive fairness is evident in fairness metrics, which are measures designed to address algorithmic fairness. Programmers tend to construct algorithmic fairness tools according to performance parity criteria. 74. By operationalizing technical definitions of algorithmic fairness based on the equity of the outcomes received, which involves comparing one's inputs to obtained outputs relative to others. 75. Fairness through unawareness is a method that removes data, such as protected attributes like race and sex, which are considered prima facie to be unfair. 76, for example, where an algorithm is used by judges making parole decisions, data on ethnic origin would be removed when training the algorithm, while data on the number of previous offenses would be retained. 77, demographic parity is where a positive prediction is assigned to two groups at a similar rate. 78, regardless of whether a person is in a protected class. 79, for example, demographic parity for gender would be achieved where a university admissions algorithm presented 50% of its offers to women and 50% to men. 80. Equality of opportunity requires that the same beneficial predictions are assigned to individuals in each group. In other words, protected and unprotected groups should have equal true positive rates. Point eight one Kusner and Loftus suggest the example of a predictive algorithm that only grants loans to individuals who have previously paid back loans. Suppose it grants loans to individuals who pay back the loan and have a disability, and to those who pay back, and who do not have a disability at an equal rate. 82 in that case, it levels the playing field by requiring the false positive rates to be equally distributed. 83 individual fairness ensures that similar individuals receive similar predictions where they have equality of opportunity. 84 for example. An algorithm that displays job advertisements should display the same jobs to two people who are alike except for their sexual orientation. 85. 
The prioritization of distributed justice in algorithmic fairness metrics denies procedural justice pragmatism. Without the kind of predominant rationalistic approach applied to distributed justice, which focuses on prescriptive rules and technical adjustments that yield objectively fairer outcomes 86, procedural justice is left to manifest through the perception of the user, whilst perception is undoubtedly essential to trust, particularly where the decision maker's trustworthiness is uncertain 87, as in the case of AI 88, it will differ according to the nature of the task, its complexity, the level of involvement of the human, 89 and the perceptions of unfairness of existing decision-making processes, 90. Greenberg and Kropenzano's description of procedural justice as hinging on explanations recognized as reasonable, understandable, and responsive to the decision, subjects, needs, and concerns, 91, goes to the core of the problem with reliance on the perception of fairness alone. If what is reasonable is based upon a subjective perception, it will likely become conflated with the decision subject's needs and concerns. Subjectivity does not account for what people do not know. Individuals do not always understand the complexity behind decision-making, such as financial pressures, market competition, human resource issues, policies, and politics. In the context of government decision-making, justice must be understood in terms of administrative justice, which requires balance with the mechanisms of administration. Procedural justice that is reliant on perception has implications for voice. Many algorithms are intentionally opaque to protect competitive commercial advantage or are intrinsically illiterate, meaning only those with technical expertise can understand them. 92. Even if opacity is non-intentional, many decision subjects will be challenged by explainability. As systems begin to learn, iterate, and improve upon themselves in unpredictable or otherwise unintelligible ways. Their logic often becomes less intuitive to human onlookers. Point nine three, although it has been questioned whether greater algorithmic transparency would always increase trust. 94. It is evident that without at least a fundamental understanding of the decision-making processes, a person will not have the full capacity to provide information once the criteria for a decision are explained. There is no suggestion that procedural justice is not an issue that occupies the musings of organizational theorists and technical ethicists. Indeed, some have considered ways that procedural justice might be designed into fairness metrics. Morse and Theodores could propose a framework that can be integrated with traditional fairness metrics based on distributive justice. 95 as an example, the authors suggest that managers could implement demographic parity in the automated stages of the job interview process and explain how they use this criterion to job candidates. Others have considered the importance of transparency in outcome control 96 and the role of procedural justice in human resource algorithmic decisions. 97 however, metrics that reflect procedural fairness remain primarily theoretical and procedural justice depends on will and organizational culture rather than entrenchment into data or model design. Regulation The rise of AI has handed public administration the difficult task of creating frameworks to regulate, guide, and manage rapidly changing technology. Although regulation is commonly understood as statutory instruments that create rules or principles 98 for a subject matter or field, regulation can also take the form of other informal modalities. Lessig identifies these modalities as social norms, the market, and the architecture or design of technological applications. 99. For the purpose of this discussion, regulation will be considered as comprising AI ethics guidelines and B. Statutory instruments, which, together, provide the current regulatory framework for algorithmic decision making. The capacity of AI ethics guidelines and statutory instruments to incorporate and propagate procedural justice is limited when presented as an aspirational principle that applies to both public and private AI actors in a non-contextual way. Procedural justice tends to take on a character of generality, as discussed below. Whilst distributive justice finds a comfortable home in AI regulation, the same cannot be said for procedural justice and voice. AI ethics guidelines, amidst the global race to develop regulation that balances innovation and competitiveness with societal protection, guidelines for developing and implementing AI have emerged. These AI ethics guidelines have primarily been developed by specialized groups at the country and regional levels, 
as well as by private organizations. Some examples include the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence appointed by the European Commission, 100 the expert group on AI in Society of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, 101 the Advisory Council on the Ethical Use of Artificial Intelligence and Data in Singapore, 102 the Association of Computing Machinery, ACM, 103 in NGOs Access Now 104 in Interpol, 105 Ethics Guidelines Act as Aspirational Guides for the Use of AI 106, and may be precursors to formal regulation. Ethics Guidelines create and promote values that guide the development and implementation of AI. A study by Jobin and others on the content of AI Ethics Guidelines identified 11 overarching ethical values and principles, transparency, justice and fairness, non-maleficence, responsibility, privacy, beneficence, freedom and autonomy, trust, dignity, sustainability, and solidarity, 107, an amorphous sense of fairness weighted toward distributive justice, is common to AI ethical guidelines. The European Commission's high-level expert group's recommendation of the Council on Artificial Intelligence EU recommendation requires AI to include human-centered values and fairness. 108 human-centered values and fairness are defined as freedom, dignity and autonomy, privacy and data protection, non-discrimination and equality, diversity, fairness, social justice, and internationally recognized labor rights. Point one zero nine Japan's social principles of human-centric AI include fairness, accountability, and transparency. Fairness is described as undue discrimination with regard to personal or background or to unfair treatment in terms of human dignity. 110, in China's The Ethical Norms for the New Generation Artificial Intelligence Fairness is mentioned in relation to promoting fairness and justice, which means adhering to shared benefits and inclusivity, effectively protecting the legitimate rights and interests of all relevant stakeholders, and fully respecting and helping vulnerable groups and underrepresented groups, 111 Although Canada does not use the word fairness in its Montreal Declaration, for a responsible development of artificial intelligence Montreal Declaration, the equity principle focuses on discrimination, power, social inequalities, and vulnerabilities. 112 The Dubai AI Ethics Guidelines state under the heading of fairness the consideration should be given to whether decision. Making processes introduced by S113 although fairness has both distributive and procedural justice meanings, without extrapolation, its meaning becomes circular i.e. fairness is fairness. Instead of a voice, fairness in the guidelines tends to be equated with justice, meaning the prevention, monitoring or mitigation of unwanted bias and discrimination. Point one one four drawing on the statutory interpretation maxim nocitor associates, a thing is known by its associates. The interpretation of fairness is gathered from its associated words, which, in the case of ethics guidelines, are values of distributive justice, egg freedom, dignity and autonomy, privacy and data protection, non-discrimination and equality, diversity, social justice, and internationally recognized labor rights. Accordingly, fairness is more likely to be understood in its distributive justice sense, in contrast to fairness. Transparency tends to be explicitly referenced and prioritized in AI ethics guidelines. Indeed, Jobin and others found transparency to be referenced in 73 out of 84 guidelines. 115, under the heading Transparency and Explainability in the EU recommendation is the requirement that AI actors provide meaningful information, appropriate to the context. Point 116 in Canada's Montreal Declaration. Democratic participation principles comprehensively describe the features of transparency as intelligibility, justifiability, accessibility, reporting, deliberation, and knowability. 117 The Montreal Declaration also demands that the code for algorithms always be accessible to the relevant public authorities and stakeholders for verification and control purposes. Transparency is explicitly addressed in Japan's social principles. Principle 6, Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency. China's ethical norms commit to improve transparency, interpretability, understandability, reliability, and controllability in algorithm design, implementation, and application.
The Dubai AI ethics guidelines include transparent, meaning traceability, and requiring users to be informed of the extent of their interaction with AI systems. 118 Transparency reinforces voice by supporting choice and providing a path for redress. The EU recommendation states that those affected by an AI system must be able to understand the outcome. If a person is adversely affected by a system, there must be an opportunity to challenge its outcome based on plain and easy to understand information on the factors and the logic that served as the basis for the prediction, recommendation or decision 119. Japan's social principles makes a similar but broader statement on voices redress, declaring that in order for people to understand AIS proposals and make judgments on them, there should be appropriate opportunities for an open dialogue, as required, regarding the use, adoption, and operation of AI. 122 bias guidelines mention both the ability to challenge significant automated decisions concerning them, and the ability to opt out of such decisions. Point one two one. Although China's ethical norms mention the need to establish an accountability mechanism, voices spoken about in terms of the choice not to engage with AI services, rather than the ability to challenge decisions or seek redress. 122 Singapore's Advisory Guidelines on the Use of Personal Data in AI Recommendation and Decision Systems, Singapore Guidelines, 123 requires meaningful consent before organizations can use personal data, meaning that organizations must inform individuals of the purposes for which their personal data is collected, used, and disclosed, whilst the inclusion of fairness and transparency and AI ethics guidelines support procedural justice. They have a limited capacity to create an expectation for voice, let alone compel its manifestation. As mentioned, the ambiguity of fairness pushes the focus to distributive justice. Although choice speaks to an opportunity to consent to the algorithm, Redress can only create an expectation for an opportunity to challenge a decision without the procedural safeguards needed for that to occur. Choice can also be actively excluded. For instance, the Singapore guidelines generally allow organizations to use personal data where there is meaningful consent. However, organizations may also rely on exceptions based upon business improvement or research purposes. Point one two four an inherent tension between harm protection and the encouragement of commercial innovation can dampen the impact of transparency principles, which is an issue that is revisited in relation to formal regulation below. Fundamentally, AI ethics guidelines do precisely what they say, guide. It has been argued that AI ethics guidelines present a principled approach that, without punitive mechanisms and official governance, runs the risk of merely providing false assurances of ethical or trustworthy AI.125 whilst ethics guidelines are valuable for identifying values, creating community expectations and providing the groundwork for formal regulation. Their ability to fully incorporate voices blunted by the broad, aspirational nature of their values and an unbalanced emphasis on distributive justice. Formal regulation Formal regulation of AI that develops standards, sets defaults, and translates fundamental legal principles into hardware and software. 126 is increasingly incorporated into existing legal regimes, a nascent AI, dedicated regulation. The development and deployment of AI are regulated by disciplines as varied as tax law, tort law, privacy and data protection law, IP law, competition law, health law, public procurement law, and consumer protection law, 127, for example, the privacy obligations in the Australian Privacy Act, 1988, will apply where personal information is used to train, test, or deploy an AI system. 128, although the GDPR does not include the term artificial intelligence, its focus on data subjects means that many of its provisions will apply to AI systems and algorithmic decision-making to some degree. 129. Some countries have introduced AI-specific regulations. Brazil is currently considering a legislative proposal designed to establish principles, rules, and guidelines to regulate the development and application of AI.130. The United States is also considering drafting AI-based legislation. 131 in June, 2022. The Canadian government introduced the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act IDA within Bill C-27, 
known as the Digital Charter Implementation Act. 2022.132 Earlier in 2019, Canada issued a directive on automated decision-making, which requires algorithmic impact assessments for administrative, i.e. government decisions before AI systems become operational. Notice where AL supports decision-making and explanations of any such decisions after the fact. 133 on the 13th of March, 2024, the European Parliament adopted the Artificial Intelligence Act, EU AI Act.134. The EU AI Act regulates AI systems according to their classified level of risk. The Act outright bans systems deemed to present an unacceptable risk. Such systems include those that deploy subliminal techniques, exploit people's vulnerabilities, engage, disability, social score, and predict the likelihood of a person committing a crime. 135 high-risk systems, which are the most regulated by the Act, including biometric systems that recognize emotions or categorize individuals according to protected attributes such as sex and race, systems that monitor student behavior during tests within educational settings, recruitment systems that use AI to evaluate candidates and law enforcement systems that assess the risk of a natural person becoming the victim of criminal offenses, 136 limited risk systems, or general purpose AI models, are subject to transparency requirements. Minimal or no risk systems are not subject to regulation. It is mandatory for public bodies and private organizations providing essential public services, including organizations outside the EU that offer AI products or services to users in the EU, to develop comprehensive compliance strategies for high-risk AI systems. These strategies include establishing a risk management system and adhering to acceptable data governance and management practices. 137 member states must establish penalties and other enforcement measures for operators that infringe the Act. Operators that do not comply with Article 5 regarding AI systems classified as unacceptable risk will be subject to fines up to 35 euros or 7% of global turnover. 138 A proposed European AI Office plus national competent market surveillance authorities will supervise the implementation of the new rules and enforce binding rules on AI.139 as the EU AI Act is the first comprehensive regulation of AI and thus algorithmic decision making. It will be the focus of the analysis in this section. Regulations present a promising avenue for voice because of their ability to develop rules around transparency and provide standards clarity to enable individuals to understand how the decision maker will interpret and respond to their input 140 accordingly. Regulations can meet procedural justice expectations to ensure that authorities genuinely commit to acting on valid concerns. 141 If segments of the community are denied a voice in stating and resolving problems, they may experience regulation as an unfair and unreasonable imposition. 142 When voice is embedded in regulation, there is a greater probability of respect, acceptance, and legitimacy. Transparency is the primary procedural justice value found in a formal regulation. Indeed, calls for AI regulation are often focused, sometimes exclusively, on transparency. 143 In the EU AI Act, transparency is prioritized by requiring general purpose AI systems to meet transparency obligations such as keeping technical documentation up to date and providing information that would enable users to have a good understanding of the system. 144 developers of general purpose systems that have been classified as having systemic risk 145 are also expected to keep track of, document, and report relevant information about serious incidents and possible corrective measures to address them. 146. Some AI systems have specific transparency obligations. For example, AI systems intended to interact directly with natural persons must be designed and developed to ensure that people are informed that they are interacting with an AI system. AI systems that generate deep fakes, i.e. synthetic audio, image, video, or text content, must be marked in a machine-readable format and detectable as artificially generated or manipulated. 147 beyond these baseline transparency obligations, 
high-risk systems must adhere to data governance and record-keeping practices, provide detailed documentation, and meet high standards for accuracy and cybersecurity. 148 Furthermore, high-risk systems must be registered in an EU-wide public database. 149. Despite centering transparency, the EU AI Act contains measures that can weaken voice. Article 13 requires high-risk systems to be designed and developed to ensure their operation is sufficiently transparent and interpretable to the deployer. A deployer is a natural or legal person, including a public authority, agency, or other body, using an AI system under its authority or in their professional capacity. 150 Deployers of high-risk systems must receive instructions that are concise, complete, correct and clear and relevant, accessible and comprehensible. Point 151 The deployer, however, is not the specific persons or groups of persons on which the system is intended to be used. Point 152 Accordingly, the right to information about the system does not extend to its end user. Although a person or group impacted by an AI system's deployment has a right to know the system's logic under the GDPR. 153 The system must be classified as processing personal data, which may not cover some AI systems, such as those that deal with information about someone deceased, properly anonymized data and information about public authorities and companies. 154 Rampers person affected by a decision made by a high risk AI system may have the right to obtain clear and meaningful explanations of the role of the AI system, but only where it produces legal effects or similarly significantly affects that person in a way they consider to have an adverse impact on their health, safety or fundamental rights. 155 This is potentially a high bar. These safeguards apply to high-risk systems only. High-risk systems do not include many or most AI systems consumers encounter daily, such as search engines, content moderation, and profiling for targeted interventions. 156 Nor does it factor in the needs of people with a disability. 157 Further, the Act's transparency and explanation requirements do not apply to all AI systems that could be considered high-risk. Although registration in a public database is required for high-risk systems, Article 49 excludes systems used in law enforcement and asylum and border control management. Instead, these systems are to be registered in a secure non-public section of the EU database and are required to provide more limited information. The Act's reach to private organizations that deploy AI systems is limited, although the EU AI Act applies to private bodies. High-risk systems are primarily restricted to those providing essential public services, such as hospitals, schools, banks, and assurance companies. 158 in addition, Article 78, ensures that confidential business information or trade secrets of a natural or legal person are respected, while protecting trade secrets is essential to foster competition and innovation. The more amorphous confidential business information which may or may not have commercial value, extends confidentiality in an unclear way. Unlike AI ethics guidelines, the EU AI Act does not prioritize choice, nor ensure it. The public nature of many systems regulated under the Act means that in many cases, such as tax administration tools, people cannot simply opt out. However, some systems, such as those provided by private education providers, are not public nor governed by legislation. In contrast, choice is explicitly addressed in the GDPR, which creates a right for an individual to opt out of an automated decision, making system as long as the system's procedure is not made compulsory by national or European law. 159. The EU AI Act does not stipulate a path for complaint or address. 160 except to say that any natural or legal person with grounds to consider an infringement of the act is entitled to lodge a complaint to the relevant market surveillance authority. 161. In considering whether an AI system poses a risk of harm to the health and safety or a risk of adverse impact on fundamental rights, the Commission is to take into account existing effective measures of redress in relation to the risks posed by an AI system, 162 The only mention of appeal is in Article 44, 3, which states that an appeal procedure against decisions of the notified bodies shall be available.
This provision, which also requires decisions to be given, relates to deployers of AI systems who have had their certificate of conformity suspended or withdrawn. There is no similar clause pertaining to the users of AI systems. A report by the Ada Lovelace Institute argues that end users are not given a voice throughout the EU AI Act. The report states that the Act does not give users a chance to make points when unelected industry-dominated technical bodies turn democratically made rules into the standards that actually tell companies making AI how to build it, and, most importantly, does not allow users to challenge or complain about AI systems down the line when they do go wrong and infringe their rights. 163. Finally, AI regulations, like ethics guidelines, will likely trade fairness in its distributive justice rather than procedural sense. The EU AI Act provides measures to alleviate risks. Risks are defined in terms of distributive justice indicators, such as harm, vulnerability, exploitation, discrimination, privacy, and inequity. It follows that fairness becomes translated as risk control through measures such as banning applications identified as unacceptable risk. General technology regulations, such as the EU AI Act, where the subject matter is AI technology, rather than the context in which AI will operate, will struggle to adequately provide for voice because voice requires context. Regulation must respond to systems and developers in many fields, each with different processes, values, and objectives. The diversity of providers, public and private, operating across multiple jurisdictions inevitably gives rise to regulatory and enforcement gaps and inconsistencies 164 imprecise guidance. Or overarching regulation may not adequately capture the specific regulatory demands of different AI techniques or applications. 165 in addition, Regulating AI needs to avoid inflexible rules if innovation and global competitiveness are to be encouraged. On the 29th of March, 2023, the UK government published its AI regulation white paper, presenting a proportionate and pro-innovation regulatory framework for AI designed to support innovation, identify and address risks, and establish the UK as an AI superpower. 166 avoiding blanket AI-specific regulation, the regulation will focus on existing sector, specific regulators who are best placed to consider the impact on their sectors of any subsequent regulation, which may be needed 167 A set of cross, sectoral principles will be tailored and applied by regulators in regulatory sandboxes, and overseen by an AI authority. The principles are, 1. Safety, security, and robustness, 2. Appropriate transparency and explainability. 3. Fairness, 4. Accountability and governance, and 5. Contestability and redress. How these principles are designed and implemented is the responsibility of sector regulators. The Artificial Intelligence Regulation Bill passed its second reading on the 22nd of March. 2024.168 Roberts and others argue that the UK's sector-led governance approach is a pragmatic option because of its strong emphasis on 1. Context and 2. Flexibility. 169 ethical risks are highly context-specific. The authors give the example of AI systems for high-risk medical decisions, for which it would be reasonable to expect a high degree of scrutiny compared with supply chain logistics, which has a lower impact and requires less scrutiny. The UKS approach has been criticized as a light-touch approach to regulating AI that is unlikely to establish the necessary guardrails to make it safe and reliable and countries favor greater regulation as they develop a deeper understanding of the uses of AI. 170, a proposal paper for introducing mandatory guardrails for AI in high-risk settings issued by the Australian government in September 2024 suggests that guardrails should be distributed according to which actors are best equipped to address risks this may be a more effective contextual approach than relying on sector-led governance because it takes into consideration each actor's access to critical information such as training data and their ability to effectively intervene and change an AI system. 171 It is noted that soon after coming to government in the UK, the Labour Party announced it would ensure the safe development and use of AI models by introducing binding regulation on the handful of companies developing the most powerful AI models, and by banning the creation of sexually explicit 
Deepfix 172A flexible, contextual approach to AI regulation, however defined, may encourage voice because it allows regulators to create mechanisms that respond to the processes and regulatory needs of a particular AI forum just as regulatory authorities will be encouraged to come up with novel solutions based on their existing governance approaches and expertise. 173 They will also need to design responsive and contextual mechanisms for voice. Whilst the precise meaning of voice will depend on the regulatory context, it will be assured if principles that include expectations of consent, transparency, and the opportunity to provide information are embedded as regulatory standards, human rights, Human rights are increasingly recognized as an integral part of the accountability conversation about algorithmic justice. In 2017, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, which is the world's largest technical professional organization, issued a report stating that AI should be created and operated to respect, promote, and protect internationally recognized human rights. 174, the UN Office of the Human Rights Commissioner, has stated that instead of risk-based regulation, which focuses on self-regulation and self-assessment by AI developers, regulation must embed human rights in the collection and selection of data, as well as the design, development, deployment, and use of the resulting models, tools, and services. 175. Countries such as Australia support a human rights-centric approach to AI.176 International Human Rights can act as an accountability framework that is applied throughout the algorithm's life cycle to address gaps. McGregor and others identify these gaps as an agreed understanding of harm, the design of the decision-making process, the obligations and responsibilities of states and businesses, and remedies for harm. 177 Human Rights Impact Assessment HRIA tools have been championed as a pragmatic way to embed a human rights framework in algorithmic design and application. HRIAs assess the potential or actual impact of an organization's strategy, practice, or product on people's human rights. 178 The NGO Access Now, which defends the digital rights of people and communities at risk, suggests that HRIAs should identify who may be affected by the proposed activity, Catalog the relevant human rights standards and issues. Project how that activity and associated business relationships could have adverse human rights impacts. And identify mitigations that might eliminate or reduce the level of risk to an acceptable level. 179 Mantelero proposes an HRIA model that is designed to respond to the specific nature of AI applications in terms of scale, impacted rights and freedoms, prior assessment of production design, an assessment of risk levels, and which can apply to the system throughout its life cycle. 180. The EU AI Act is the first formal regulatory scheme to operationalize HRIAs for AI by requiring high risk systems to be accompanied by fundamental rights impact assessments before being deployed in the market. There is much promise in HRIAs providing an accountability framework for algorithmic justice. HRIAs can be applied to public authorities 181 and private bodies 182 because, as an impact assessment tool, they are not constrained by binding obligations nor the jurisdictional limitations of litigation. Although private bodies are not formally obligated to protect human rights, core internationally recognized human rights are recognized as providing a framework for impact assessment. 183 core internationally protected rights are those contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UDHR, and the main instruments through which it has been codified, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR. 184 and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, 185, Coupled with the principles concerning fundamental rights in the eight international labor organization core conventions as set out in the Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, 186 for states, the human rights standards on which to base impact assessments are those they are internationally obligated to protect, largely reflecting the core rights discussed above. The ability of HRIAs to bring international human rights into the domestic context is particularly important for modest countries such as Australia, which do not have explicit human rights.
fact-based constitutional frameworks on which the courts can rely. 187, however, the efficacy of HRIAs is dictated by the nature and limitations of human rights frameworks. HRIAs need to measure not only whether human rights are impacted, but also whether restrictions on those rights are legally justified. If an AI system restricts non-absolute rights, any restriction of those rights in pursuit of a legitimate aim must be considered. Human rights restrictions would be justified if they are reasonable, necessary, and proportional to achieving the legitimate aim. 188 further, the scope of human rights cannot be expanded to fit an accountability narrative. This, in particular, presents a challenge to human rights that protect procedural justice, which, in turn, raises questions about the capacity of HRIAs to ensure voice. The primary procedural human right, common to all international and regional human rights instruments, is the right to a fair trial. Article 10 of the UDHR states that every person has the right to a fair and public trial and an independent and impartial tribunal in relation to criminal charges. The right to be treated equally before courts and tribunals and the entitlement to a public hearing by a competent, independent and impartial tribunal established by law is affirmed by Article 14, 1 of the ICCPR which is a binding instrument. Article 6, 1, of the European Convention on Human Rights, ECHR, 189, ensures that everyone is entitled to a fair and public hearing within a reasonable time by an independent and impartial tribunal established by law in the determination of civil rights and obligations and criminal charges. Article 8, 1, of the American Convention on Human Rights, ACHR, states that every person has the right to a hearing, with due guarantees and within a reasonable time, by a competent, independent, and impartial tribunal, which relates to criminal charges and any rights and obligations of a civil, labor, fiscal, or any other nature. Point one nine zero similar clauses are found in other regional and domestic human rights instruments. 191. While none of the instruments define fair trial, it embodies two elements reflecting voice. First, it is the right of access to a tribunal or the right to institute proceedings. 192 second, it is the right that those proceedings be fair. Fairness requires the opportunity to make submissions and respond to adverse information. As Tyler reminds us, courts are required to ensure participation, enabling people to tell their side of the story in their own words. Before making decisions 193 courts, are required to adequately represent the different viewpoints of the parties, and to carefully assess the merits of each argument. 194 hearings must also be free from bias and interference from political power. 195. The scope of the right to a fair trial provides challenges for algorithmic justice, because it is limited to matters relating to criminal charges or civil rights or obligations. Regarding civil rights and obligations, the ICCPR restricts fair trial entitlements to a suit at law. According to the UN Human Rights Committee, the meaning of a suit at law is complex 196, and a question which should be considered on its merits. 197 in YLV Canada, the committee indicated that whether something is a suit of law was based on the nature of the right in question, rather than on the status of one of the party's governmental, parastatal or autonomous statutory entities or else on the particular forum in which individual legal systems may provide that the right in question is to be adjudicated upon 198. In Peter v. Austria, the committee confirmed that Article 14, 1, is applicable in cases that cannot be considered a suit at law, but for which the state provides appropriate court procedures. 199 suit of law encompasses judicial procedures aimed at determining rights and obligations relating to private law a contract, property, and torts, and administrative law matters that impact private rights, such as the termination of employment of civil servants for non-disciplinary reasons 200 and the determination of social security benefits 201 if the decision is of a judicial nature, meaning that it is subject to judicial control or judicial review, and if it significantly impacts the individual's personal and economic situation, it will likely be regarded as a suit at law, 202 in comparison. Article 6, 1, of the ECHR expressly refers to civil rights and obligations.
Whether a right or obligation is to be regarded as civil must be determined by reference to its substantive content and effect, rather than how it is classified under the domestic law of the relevant state. 203. The applicability of Article 6, 1, to civil matters depends on the existence of a genuine and serious dispute that relates to a right recognized under domestic law. 204. Whilst private law disputes are largely uncontested as being civil in nature, public law matters are more controversial. Disputes that could be considered public that have been found to apply to Article 6, 1, include those which, in domestic law, come under public law, and whose result is decisive for private rights and obligations, or the protection of pecuniary rights. Point two zero five examples include the establishment of a right of ownership, including about a place of worship, 206, an administrative authority's refusal to comply with a decision revoking a building permit for a factory on environmental grounds, 207, a negligence claim against the state, 208, and a civil action seeking compensation for ill treatment allegedly committed by state agents, 209 or though, many administrative bodies will fall under the obligation to ensure a fair trial, because they impact personal rights, some decisions are excluded due to their public law nature, in the ECHR, matters that have been found to be purely public law and do not fall under Article 6, 1, include the right to stand for elections, 210 the expulsion of aliens, 211 and the duty to pay tax, 212, the exclusion of matters from Article 14 of the ICCPR is even more expansive. The ICCPR does not apply where domestic law does not grant an entitlement to the person concerned. Article 14 has been held to be inapplicable in cases where domestic law did not confer a right to be promoted in the civil service. 213 to be appointed as a judge. 214 or to have a death sentence commuted by an executive body. 215 furthermore, there is no determination of rights and obligations in a suit at law where a person is subordinate to a high degree of administrative control, such as disciplinary, not penal, measures taken against a civil servant. 216 a member of the armed forces, or a prisoner. Article 14 does not apply to extradition, expulsion, and deportation procedures. 217 for algorithmic decision-making to be assessed against the right to a fair trial, the decision must have a significant or serious impact on private, i.e. civil, rights. Decisions made by public bodies are not excluded if the decision has such an effect. However, algorithmic decisions that are purely public, such as determining the payment of taxes or who should be deported, will unlikely be subject to the right to fair trial guarantees diminishing the capacity of HRIAs to assess the impact on procedural human rights. Private organizations and global businesses will make many algorithmic decisions that do not turn on legal rights and obligations, but may still be susceptible to bias and discrimination. Such decisions may relate to systems that are based on hope or expectation, such as job applications, competitions, recommender systems, and facial recognition technology. The famous Amazon recruitment controversy is a clear example. In 2017, Amazon abandoned an algorithmic recruitment tool because it demonstrated a preference for male over female candidates. The system vetted applicants by observing patterns in resumes submitted to the company over 10 years. Because the resumes were mostly from men, the system learned to disregard activities associated with women. 218 similarly, Studies suggest that a facial recognition system embedded with racial discrimination may unfairly impact some retail consumers. Facial recognition can struggle to identify black women, affecting age estimation for targeted marketing and identity verification. 219 as mentioned earlier, YouTube's restricted mode censored Lukmchkia plus material based on the bias of the user. 220 in these examples, voice still requires transparency consent, and the right to feedback, but a right to a fair trial does not apply, because the subject of the decision is not civil rights and obligations. That is not to say that decisions made by private organizations that do not turn on civil rights and obligations cannot infringe on anti-discrimination laws and human rights. Indeed, as demonstrated below, the fact that they do so is a reason why distributive justice rights find a more comfortable home in human rights as an accountability framework.
the benefits of international human rights law to algorithmic justice tend to be discussed in relation to the central contribution they can make to counter general descriptors of bias or discrimination. 221 indeed, in Europe, human rights cases relating to AI have so far only addressed substantive rights. Cases have primarily challenged breaches of Article 8, which establishes a right to respect for private and family life, as well as Article 10, freedom of expression, and Article 14, which prohibits discrimination. In the EU Court of Human Rights, Digital distributive justice cases include a claim of violation of a right to privacy for the retention of fingerprints, DNA samples, and DNA profiles indefinitely after criminal proceedings had been discontinued. 222 breaches to Article 8 were also challenged in relation to surveillance by the Hungarian government that was unjustified and disproportionately intrusive. 223 a Russian secret interception of mobile telephone communications that violated rights to respect for private life and correspondence. 224 The German Telecommunications Act, which made registration for prepaid SIM cards obligatory. 225 And the indefinite retention of the DNA profile. Fingerprints and photographs of people who were convicted for an offense punishable by imprisonment. 226 In one case. An automated facial recognition tool used by South Wales Police, SWP, to scan tens of thousands of faces without consent to check the faces against those placed on a watch list was found to be contrary to Art 8 of the ECHR, as it conferred too much discretion on the police. 227 Some notable human rights cases have also been decided in domestic courts. In February, 2020, the District Court of The Hague, Wretched Bank Den Haag, ruled that the use of the SYRI algorithm system, system risk indication, a digital welfare fraud detection system applied by the Dutch government, violated Article 8 of the ECHR. 228 in the 2018 Canadian case of Ewart versus Canada, the applicants challenged the use of psychological and actuarial risk assessment tools used for determining the risk of recidivism to consider whether parole should be granted. The court found that the tools were in breach of Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. 229 HRIAs are undoubtedly a positive step towards ensuring algorithmic justice. However, they are imbued with the same restrictions as the human rights they measure. Voices embedded in a right to a fair trial, but its scope is curtailed by the kind of rights and obligations the decision impacts meaning that many algorithmic decisions won't fall under its purview. In practice, HRIAs are more suited to distributive justice rights, which respond better to algorithmic justice. Perhaps the way forward is, as Lorkite suggests, to expand human rights frameworks to encompass algorithmic rights that could include the right to algorithmic transparency and explainability, the right to be informed when interacting with an automated system, and the right to choose a human over an algorithm. 230 for voice to be realized. Algorithmic rights must also include the right to provide information before a decision is finalized. The Council of Europe's Convention on AI, Human Rights, Democracy, and the Rule of Law, which is the world's first binding international treaty on AI. 231 could be a step forward in developing a rights-based approach to AI. The convention, which opened for signature on the 5th of September, 2024, establishes fundamental principles for AI systems, including human dignity and individual autonomy, equality and non-discrimination, respect for privacy and personal data protection. The convention compels parties to commit to maintaining measures to ensure that adequate transparency and oversight requirements, tailored to the specific contexts and risks, are in place. Parties must adopt or maintain measures to ensure the availability of accessible and effective remedies, including ensuring that information enables concerned people to challenge an AI-based decision and redress for complaints. People must also be told they are interacting with an AI system, not a human being. While these measures are promising for voice, their application depends on international, regional, and domestic laws and accountability mechanisms which, as discussed throughout this paper, can be burdened by their own procedural gaps. Judicial review the procedural gap in fairness metrics, regulation, 
and human rights as accountability frameworks for algorithmic justice pushes the conversation towards the final and, perhaps, ultimate mechanism for procedural justice, judicial review, a comparative examination of judicial review in Europe, the USA, and Australia reveals the jurisdiction, scope, reviewability, and the decision maker will determine how effectively courts can address voice in algorithmic justice. The greatest potential for judicial review to ensure voice in algorithmic justice is its innate ability to respond to context and the competing demands of administrative justice. When rules are not engraved on tablets of stone, the values of good administration, the rule of law, and democracy 232 are accorded equal significance. Indeed, as Lord Pearson observes, if there were too much elaboration of procedural safeguards, nothing could be done simply and quickly and cheaply. 233 Regardless of jurisdictional differences, judicial review's procedural rather than substantive nature assures its contextuality. However, a clear path for voice is by no means guaranteed, as explored below, jurisdiction-specific structures, developments, and principles create obstacles for voice in algorithmic justice, regardless of judicial review's contextual, responsive nature. Australia, scope and reviewability after Pinterich in common law systems, procedural fairness is embedded in the law as a ground of judicial review that oversees administrative decision-making. Procedural fairness, which developed in the UK common law in the early 17th century, is the obligation to apply procedures fairly. 234 Australian High Court Justices, Dixon CJ and Webb J commented that procedural fairness is a deep, rooted principle of the law that before anyone can be punished or prejudiced in his person or property, by a judicial or quasi-judicial proceeding, he must be afforded an adequate opportunity to be heard. 235. Procedural fairness is understood to have two components. First, the prior hearing rule audi alterum partum requires that the decision maker tell the person that a decision will be made, what material was used to make that decision, and give them the right to reply or be heard before the decision is finalized. Second, the bias rule nema debit esse judex in propria sua casusa requires the decision maker to be free of any real or apprehension of bias regarding their personal financial circumstances, interests, prior expressions of opinion, or previous role in the decision, 236. The rules of common law procedural fairness do not have immutably fixed content 237 and, therefore, offer a contextual, responsive approach to judicial review that could support and promote voice and algorithmic justice. Three characteristics support this argument. First, a threshold test triggers who is entitled to procedural fairness by requiring that a person be affected by a decision. 238, to be affected by a decision means that a person's rights or interests must be impacted in a direct and immediate way. 239, the inclusion of interests could help capture the kind of algorithmic decision making that does not directly affect traditionally defined rights. Take, for example, an industry body that makes an algorithmic decision that impacts a person's commercial interests. If the impact on those commercial interests indirectly affects that person's rights, egg proprietary or livelihood, they may be entitled to procedural fairness. 240 This flexibility expands the scope for voice beyond regulation or HRIAs, which are founded on legal rights. Two other factors ensure that procedural fairness is responsive to the competing demands of administrative justice and good administration. Procedural fairness is generally expected to apply, unless it has been excluded or diminished by legislation, where there are plain words of necessary intendment. 241 Several other factors can also impact whether procedural fairness applies, including the seriousness or urgency of a subject matter. 242 Whether the decision-making power impacts public interest or individual rights, the existence of an appeal, the parties to the dispute, and the institutional and statutory context. 243 Accordingly, what procedural fairness looks like depends on context. In addition, the decision must have created a practical injustice. A person is entitled to relief for a breach of procedural fairness, unless the court is satisfied that the breach could have had no bearing on the outcome of the decision. As former Chief Justice Gleason explained, F. Fairness is not an abstract concept. It is essentially practical.
Whether one talks in terms of procedural fairness or natural justice, the concern of the law is to avoid practical injustice 244, despite the promise of common law procedural fairness responsiveness to context and administrative justice. Two factors limit how effective it may be in responding to voice in algorithmic justice. The first is scope. Although, historically, procedural fairness only applied to decisions by courts or bodies that had a duty to act judicially, its scope was extended in the mid-19th century to all quasi-judicial decisions. 245, however, the capacity of procedural fairness in Australia to review the decisions of private bodies remains narrow. In the UK, the court in Datafin 246 found that judicial review applies to private bodies carrying out governmental but non-statutory functions. Governmental functions were characterized by public power, which, in the case of the panel's functions, were integral to the government's regulatory approach. 247 Australian courts are yet to embrace Datafin's public power test. 248. Returning to the example above of an industry body, that makes algorithmic decisions that impact a person's interests and, indirectly, their rights, that body would likely need to be statutory for its decisions to be reviewable. For a decision to be reviewable under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review, Act 1977, A.D., J.R., Act, it must be of an administrative character, made under an enactment and be final and conclusive, not just a step along the way to a binding outcome. 249 for a decision to be reviewable under the common law. The matter must involve an officer of the Commonwealth. 250. It follows that bodies that make judicially reviewable decisions are generally statutory and or involve public officials. Algorithmic decisions made by private companies are not judicially reviewable under Australian law, meaning that the rules of procedural fairness will not apply. Even if Datafin were found to apply to Australian law, the decision-making body would need to perform a public duty or exercise a public power rather than, for example, draw its decision, making powers from private contracts with its members. 251 second, the scope for reviewability of fully automated public, i.e. administrative decisions made by algorithms is currently unclear. In the case of Pinterich, 252 the Federal Court found that a decision made by the Deputy Commissioner of Taxation to refuse a taxpayer's request for remission of his general interest charge liabilities was not reviewable under the A.D. J.R. Act. In Pinterich, the Court found that a valid decision requires two elements, a mental process of deliberation, assessment, and or analysis 253 in an objective manifestation of that decision, 254. The majority concluded that there was no reviewable decision because the deputy commissioner had not undertaken a mental process of deliberation, although not expressed, the implication was that only a human decision maker can undertake a mental process, while not tested, common law as the alternative to statutory judicial review may fare no better, as Ungan O'Sullivan argue, where an algorithm makes a decision, it will be difficult to argue that it is judicially reviewable. As courts have interpreted an officer of the Commonwealth as requiring a formal appointment of a natural person, and a prohibition against artificial persons, 255, under current Australian law, decisions will likely require a human in the loop to be judicially reviewable, whilst courts can ensure voice in some algorithmic decisions, where decisions are made by a private body or entirely, or even mostly by algorithms, the rules of procedural fairness may not apply. Europe, the chilling effects of the AI Act in the European context. National constitutional courts or Supreme Courts undertake judicial review of legislation to ensure compliance with national constitutions. Courts determine whether there has been a fundamental breach of constitutional principles of administrative proprietary and fairness. 256 such as the rule of law, good governance, 257 legality, due process, and transparency, 258 for example, section 21 of the Finnish constitution states that every person has the right to have his or her case dealt with appropriately and without undue delay by a legally competent authority. 259 further, the right to be heard, the right to receive a reasoned decision and other guarantees of a fair trial and good governance must be included in domestic acts. 260. Several European countries also have administrative courts 
which are responsible for reviewing administrative action and ensuring the legality of administrative decisions, which often relate to administrative rules and procedures. Before the introduction of the AI Act and without national regulatory frameworks, European courts have taken an active, or even activist 261 role, in ensuring constitutional guarantees of procedural protections in algorithmic decision-making. For example, in its 2021 ECASA decision, 262, the Slovak Constitutional Court considered the validity of indiscriminate data collection and the automated reuse of store receipts for risk profiling. In claiming that technological progress in public administration cannot result in an impersonal state, whose decisions are inexplicable, and explained and at the same time no one is responsible for them. 263. The court declared that the legislature has the responsibility to ensure transparency and abide by procedural requirements arising from the Slovakian constitution, including access to the logic of decisions. This obligation arises even when the third party i.e. a private body provides the technology. In 2019, the Italian Higher Administrative Court, Consiglio di Stato, and the Administrative Court of Lazio considered an automated system designed to evaluate how to manage the mobility of high school teachers for the 2016-2017 academic year. In the Buenos Schooler cases, the Consiglio di Stato claimed technical rules that govern algorithms are administrative rules built by man and not by the machine and, therefore, are subject to the general principles of administrative activity, such as those of publicity and transparency in art. 1.1241 stroke 90, the Italian Administrative Procedure Act. 264 It is noted that Art. 10.1b expressly allows for voice by ensuring that parties have the ability to present documents and written arguments, which the authority has the duty to evaluate provided that they are pertinent to the object of the procedure. The Lazio court agreed that automated procedures could never be substituted for the cognitive, inquisitive, and judgmental activities of human procedures. This aligns with procedural protections in the Italian Constitution and Article 6 of the ECHR. 265. Similarly, in the AERI US case, 266 the Dutch Council of State, Ra Van State, considered a software system, AERI US, the calculated nitrogen deposition standards in order to determine whether an activity was subject to a permit decision. The council found that there was a duty to publish, on the authority's initiative choices, data, and the assumptions that underlie the system in a complete, timely, and accessible manner. The council developed a procedural standard to combat parties being put in an unequal procedural position that arises when subjects are insufficiently informed of the nature of the algorithm and to enable courts to review the legality of decisions. 267. The AI Act introduces a risk that standardized Europe-wide regulation will have a chilling effect on national courts' ability to provide procedural protections relating to algorithmic decision making. 268. This risk arises from the primacy of the AI Act over domestic EU law. In the European Commission's proposal for a unified act to regulate AI across Europe, it stated that the legal basis for the proposal is Article 114 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, TFEU, which provides for the adoption of measures to ensure the establishment and functioning of the internal market. The Commission relied upon the principle of subsidiarity in Article 5, 3 of the TFEU to create one regulation to ensure legal cohesion, effectiveness, human rights guarantees, and competitiveness. 269 The AI Act constitutes secondary EU law, which means it has primacy over national legislation. Where there is inconsistency, the European law prevails. 270 Ampere's consequence of establishing the AI Act as secondary EU law is that national courts will be required to apply it to litigation arising from algorithmic decision-making, meaning they can no longer defer to national constitutional interpretation. 271 activist measures to ensure procedural protections and voice for algorithmic decision-making, such as those described in the cases above, will be quieted in favor of the application of legislation that has notable gaps regarding remedies and explainability that have consequences for the efficacy of voice.
The fact that the courts will be able to refer to the European Court of Justice for a preliminary ruling on the validity and interpretation of the AI Act 272 does not detract from this fact. The Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union 273, European Charter, which is primary EU legislation, may offer a way to, somewhat, address the procedural gap left by the judicial turn to AI Act. Article 41 of the European Charter ensures that every person has the right to have their affairs handled impartially, fairly, and within a reasonable time, regardless of the nature of the matter being heard. Notably, it includes the right to be heard before any potentially adverse individual measure is taken, which is fundamental to voice. However, the European Charter only applies to institutions, bodies, offices, and agencies of the Union, which does not include private organizations. Perhaps, as Pele Imiato argues, the protection of fundamental rights will be addressed through judicial dialogue between national courts and the European Court of Justice, which will offer the Luxembourg Court the opportunity to safeguard individual rights for the entire EU and develop common values of digital constitutionalism in Europe. 274 US, the due process clause and the specter of Loomis in the USA. Procedural fairness is centered on due process, which arises from the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and requires that in a criminal case, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The Fourteenth Amendment extends the due process clause to states by ensuring that no state makes or enforces a law that will abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the USA, nor deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. Without due process of law 275 nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. 276. The rights protected under the 14th and 5th Amendments are understood to include the individual rights listed in the Bill of Rights, Substantive Due Process, and Procedural Due Process. 277. Although procedural due process is defined by the nature of individual interests, and the contextual process is required to protect them, it requires, at a minimum, notice, an opportunity to be heard, and an impartial tribunal. Other requirements include the right to call or cross-examine witnesses and to present evidence, 278 as well as a written record of the proceedings and the decision, 279. The U.S. Due Process Clause has limited application to private bodies only applying where their actions can be considered state action 280 or where they perform functions traditionally reserved for the government or have contractual obligations. Consequently, private bodies that use algorithms in a discriminatory way will be excluded from its scope. Further, the due process clause is restricted to deprivation of life, liberty or property. Many algorithmic decisions will not involve deprivation of a property right where a person must show a legitimate claim of entitlement to the interest affected by governmental action. 281. The due process clause has been interpreted, sometimes controversially, in a flexible way. Examples include Gideon v. Wainwright. 282, in which the court ruled that the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel is a fundamental right that applies to the state through the Fourteenth Amendment. Miranda v. Arizona 283, established the right to remain silent, and the right to an attorney. In a Bergeval v. Hodges, 284, the court ruled that a fundamental right to marry is guaranteed to same-sex couples. At first glance, the traditional flexibility of the due process clause appears to offer promise for algorithmic justice, whose very newness calls for progressive interpretation. However, where the due process clause has been interpreted in a way that relates to algorithmic justice, it has been done so as to detract from voice. In the 2017 case of State v. Loomis, 285, the Wisconsin Supreme Court held that an algorithmic risk assessment used in sentencing did not violate the defendant's due process rights despite the assessment methodology not being disclosed to the court or defendant. 286 Loomis had been charged with five criminal counts related to a drive-by shooting. During the trial, the prosecutors relied on a program called Compass, which predicted the risk of recidivism. The Compass algorithm utilized a criminal history survey that was separated into several sections, which included current charges, criminal history, non-compliance, family criminality, 
peers, substance abuse, residence stroke stability, social environment, education, vocation, leisure stroke recreation, social isolation, criminal personality, anger, and criminal attitudes. The data was used to calculate the risk of the defendant's recidivism, which was separated into pretrial, general, and violent. The circuit court took compass outputs into account when sentencing Loomis. Loomis appealed, citing infringement of the due process clause. He argued that Compass violated a defendant's right to be sentenced based upon accurate information, because he was prevented from assessing its accuracy, due to its proprietary nature. Loomis also argued that the program violated a defendant's right to an individualized sentence, and that it improperly used gendered assessments in sentencing. 287 Focusing on Loomis' argument regarding accurate information, the court found that he had an opportunity to refute, supplement, and explain the Compass risk assessment score since the score in the report that accompanied it were not hidden from him. In 2016, ProPublica conducted a study on the validity of Compass. 288, the study analyzed data on over 7,000 offenders who received risk assessment scores after their arrests. In 2013 and 2014, it found that whilst white defendants were incorrectly labeled 23.5% of the time, Black defendants were mislabeled 44.9%. The study noted that, W, Heil black defendants had higher recidivism rates overall when adjusted for this difference and other factors. They were, 45%, more likely to get a higher score than whites. 289 after the Loomis decision, another study of Compass by computer scientists from Dartmouth asserted that the widely used commercial risk assessment software, Compass is no more accurate or fair than predictions made by people with little or no criminal justice expertise, which cast significant doubt on the entire effort of algorithmic recidivism prediction. Point two nine zero. The central concern that Loomis raises and threatens voice is that the defendant was denied a right to an explanation due to commercial proprietary and trade secrets. The court acknowledged that risk and need assessment information should not be used as an aggravating or mitigating factor in determining the severity of an offender's sanction 291. However, neither the defendant nor the court knew how the risk assessment was calculated. As Freeman argues, without access to the algorithm source code, no defendant has the means to investigate any potential misinformation. Instead, defendants can only present a superficial argument against the elements that may or may not be included in the algorithm. 292 simply put, Loomis may have seen the input and output, but had no idea of their relationship. This decision highlights the issue of a legal black box that is, that the opacity in fact comes from the propriety characteristics of statistical models or source codes, which are legally protected by relevant trade secret statutes. 293 as U.S. law currently stands, the Constitution's due process clause does not facilitate voice in relation to algorithmic justice. Of course, legal principles may evolve, but courts will need to grapple with balancing commercial interests with potential bias and discrimination. Conclusion The diversity of algorithmic decision-making means that characteristics of users, developers, form, function, and impact on rights and obligations shape algorithmic justice in its context. At the same time, voice is universal. Regardless of context, algorithmic decision-making will not find acceptance or legitimacy without procedural justice. Procedural justice will not be realized without voice, even when diminished rather than absent. In recognizing the centrality of voice to algorithmic justice, this paper reveals a procedural gap common to accountability frameworks for algorithmic decision-making, including fairness metrics, AI ethics guidelines, formal regulation, human rights, and judicial review. The reasons for the procedural gap in algorithmic justice share some commonalities. Most accountability mechanisms, except judicial review, respond better to distributive justice, resulting in a weakened focus on procedural justice and rendering concepts of fairness ambiguous. The scope of accountability mechanisms to ensure voice is determined by the nature of the decision maker, and whether the decision has impacted legal rights and obligations. Despite a focus on transparency, the non-binding nature of fairness metrics and AI ethics guidelines relegates voice to perception. HRIAs are limited by the parameters of human rights.
meaning that a right to a fair trial applies only where legal rights and obligations are the subjects of the decision, excluding many market-based and organizational algorithmic decisions. Private bodies will not be subject to or have limited applicability to HRIAs, regulations, and judicial review. Voice can also be diminished by characteristics unique to specific accountability frameworks. The nature of formal AI regulation is driven by jurisdictional concerns and the need to balance innovation and market competitiveness for the EU AI Act. This manifests as selective transparency, the exclusion of some high-risk systems, and a lack of choice and recourse for the user. Despite their procedural justice purpose, the diversity and complexity of judicial review schemes create context-specific issues of interpretation, applicability, and reviewability. None of this suggests that current measures to address algorithmic justice are not working. Algorithmic decision-making will continue to need a range of accountability mechanisms able to meet the varying demands of diverse decision-making contexts. However, if legitimacy and acceptance of algorithmic decision-making, which are crucial to market-driven and government decision-making, in democratic political systems, are to be achieved, the user's voice must be prioritized. Without transparency, choice, and the opportunity to be heard before decisions are final, the user is voiceless, and the algorithm is deaf. Copyright the author, S. 2024. Published by Oxford University Press. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creativeacommons.org slash licenses slash by slash four dot zero slash which permits unrestricted reuse, distribution, and reproduction in any medium, provided the original work is properly cited. Neve Kinchin, voiceless, The Procedural Gap in Algorithmic Justice, International Journal of Law and Information Technology, Volume 32, Issue 1, 2024, EAAE 024, HTTPS colon, slash slash, doi, dot org, slash 10, dot 1093, slash IGLIT, slash EAAE 024.